Всъщност за втори път представяме а, голямото проучване на BNP Paribas Personal Finance, на групата BNP Paribas Personal Finance, обсерватуар. А, за втора година, тъй като за втора година България е включена в него, всъщност проучването е много интересно, защото а, обхваща почти всички европейски страни, има огромно ниво на представителност и а, има много интересен фокус тази година. Това са милениалите или милениумите. Сега тук имахме малка, така, малка дискусия, кое е правилно от двете. Според БАМ милениуми е правилно, според обаче това, че факта, че милениали е доста възприето, може би и то ще се възприеме в един момент за правилно, така че ще ги наричаме милениумите. А, тъй като милениумите, де факто, това са хората родени, за които не е ясно, хората родени между 80 и 2000 година, поколението Y, е реално това е поколението, което ще определя пазара и економиката в следващите десетилетия. А, в този ред на мисли, как мисли това поколение и как взима решения, тези хора са много интересни за всички нас. И а, втория много интересен фокус а, в а, това проучване е как те пазаруват, какви искат да бъдат магазините, как искат да комуникират с търговците. И а, така, още много интересни въпроси за всеки, който малко или много се занимава с бизнес, според мен, за всеки, който, за всеки журналист, за всеки, който пише за самите потребители, защото де факто това са в момента една, един от най-важните сегменти а, от потребителите. Като стана въп, а, дума за въпроси, а, в момента на екрана може да видите, а, това е адреса на платформата Slido. А, казвам го не само за хората, които са в залата и за хората, които гледат нашия стриминг, тъй като ни излучваме стриминг в момента. А, през тази платформа могат да бъдат задавани въпроси чрез компютър, таблет или а, смартфон. Влизате на платформата slido.com, пишете хаштаг Observatoire 2018, много е user friendly, много просто, могат да се пишат въпроси, тъй като след а, всяка от нашите две презентации а, има предвиден а, Q&A session, въпроси и отговори. Аз ще модерирам, ще видя въпросите на своя компютър, ще ги насочвам към а, говорителите, към експертите, ще им отговаряме за това предлагам, а, който иска да се присъедини. Другия вариант, разбира се, ще имаме в залата микрофони, така че всеки, който иска, може да поиска микрофони да зададе въпроса а, в реално време. А, да се върна на, понеже стана да говорихме за въпроси, техните отговори ще дадат ето тези хора тук. Първо бих искал да представя Паскал. Той е директор маркетинг и продажби на BNP Paribas Personal Finance за Централна и Източна Европа. Uh, мистер uh, Жозе Салойо, господин Жозе Салойо, който е управител на BNP Paribas лични финанси България и uh, госпожа Нелина Дялкова, заместник управител на BNP Paribas лични финанси за България. Сега тук има един uh, днес леко кризисен момент, Нелия е болна и почти загуби гласа си. А за това нейната част от презентацията ще я представи Пламен, господин Пламен Георгиев, който е менеджер развитие uh, на търговските партньори и стратегически пазари. Ще поканим Пламен в реално време, когато той да реда а, за неговата част от презентацията, но а, не ли ще бъде тук и ще отговаря на въпросите а, на журналисти и на гости. Така че а, на този етап това е. Втората част обаче от нашето събитие също от сега искам да я носим, тъй като е много интересна. След а, тази презентация и въпросите и отговорите. А, много интересна презентация ще направи господин Никола Дьякуно. Той е експерт от Центъра за иновации Лешанжор, пак на BNP Paribas лични финанси в Париж. Така че а, а, той ще направи една... А, тя е още по-напред в бъдещето. Значи, ако милените са настоящето, той ще направи за Generation Z. Тоест, те са бъдещето. Много интересна презентация и също ще имаме въпроси и отговори с него, а, след като приключи. Така че... Uh, започваме. Бих искал да дам думата на господин Паскал Русари. Заповядайте. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. So, I'm Pascal Roussari. I'm Head of Sales and Marketing for Central Europe. In fact, I'm responsible for Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria. I'm really happy to be here in Sofia today just because Bulgaria is a so nice and beautiful country and today the weather is perfect. But first of all, because I'm really proud about what the local team is delivering in Bulgaria. Uh, it's amazing. Year after year, I'm really impressed by your results. And I can say that today, Bulgaria is becoming a main part of uh, the Central Europe region for BNP Paribas Personal Finance. And I know that in this room, we have partners 
And uh, I would like to thank you for choosing BNP Paribas Personal Finance to, uh, to, uh, to develop your business in Bulgaria. Really, Bulgaria, it's better and better. And thank you very much, uh, Jose. Jose is a chief executive officer of uh, BNP Paribas Personal Finance in Bulgaria. And Nelly, deputy responsible for business and operation. A few words about l'Observatoire CTLM. We started in France in 1985. And it fact, in fact, it was a really simple idea. We are between the offer and the demand. We are working with a lot of retailers. It's the offer. And we have a lot of clients. It's the demand. And we are thinking that it's the best positioning in order to deliver surveys about consumption and also about retail. In fact, you know, Today, with young people, we are working about the customer experience. We are working about the customer experience because with digital, it's only about customer experience. But you know, when we started 30 years ago, it, in fact, it was the same way of thinking. In fact, we are thinking at BNP Paribas Personal Finance that it's not possible to speak about the business, it's not possible to speak about consumption without starting by customer expectation. It's key. And it's what we are doing for more than 30, 30 years. So when we give, when we are giving results, it's not BNP Paribas personal finance speaking about consumption. It's just becoming from clients. And it's the more important. Okay? In 1999, we decided to launch a European barometer in order to well understand the situation in the whole Europe. We started with eight or nine countries. And today, we have 17 countries, because last year, Sweden and Norway uh, joined the team. Up, up. Just a second. I'm looking. Uh, I'm waiting for the next slide. But. There you go. It's OK now? <laughs> it's controlling the light. Once again? There you go. Ah, OK. Um, so, as you can see, it's in Bulgarian. <laughs> I don't speak Bulgarian. I don't read Bulgarian. My English is not so good. But everything will be OK, because we have really good translators. So it will be nice, and you will understand everything. So about the methodology. Uh, as I said, it's 17 countries. It's a lot. Countries for North Europe, South Europe, Eastern and Central Europe. Okay? Uh, the sample is close to 40,000 people. It's huge. And uh, it's enough to have really precise results. And each year, it's the same methodology online. And so it's easy for us to follow the evolution. And this year, the survey is mainly about millennials. So millennials, people born mid-80s to 2000. And uh, it's with 3,400 millennials. So we have a big sample. And in terms of results, I can say that it's perfect. It's really precise. One word about the agenda. I will present to you the global situation in Europe state of mind, purchasing power, do we want to consume, do we want to save money, everywhere in the 17 countries. Then, Jose will speak about millennials, generation yes. And you will see that it's really good, and we can be optimists for the future. And then, not Nelly, because Nelly is looking for uh, her voice, but <laughs> Plamen will speak about retail and millennials and retail. And the second part of the event will be with Nicolas, and you will see amazing things with Les Changeurs. OK? I propose to start with the global situation. And you can see that it's better and better. It's the highest level for 10 years. It's very high in North Europe. You can see in, uh, in England, you can see in uh, Germany, 
you can see also new countries we are uh, Sweden and, uh, and Norway and it's better and better in South and Central Europe of course if we have a look at Bulgaria it's increasing but for the moment it's not high level but you know I think we have to to take into account a big difference between Sofia and the rest of the country. You know, it was the case for other countries by the past. But today, I think in Bulgaria and also in Romania, we can see a lot of difference between big cities and the rest of the country. It's less and less the case, for example, in Slovakia or in Czech Republic. So, it's increasing. For the moment, it's not at the right level. I don't know if there is a right level, but it's not a good level, but it's increasing. And there is also something really amazing in Bulgaria, but it's like in France. There is a big gap between what we are thinking globally and what we are thinking on uh, an individual point of view. If I speak with people in the street in Sofia, that's sure that everything is bad. But if I speak about me, everything is okay. And so you will see that there is a big gap between global and individual. But it's better to have optimist uh, on the individual, because at the end of the day, we have to speak individual by individual. Okay? So, it's increasing. Uh, it's the highest level in Europe for 10 years. And really, it's good news. The second is the evolution for five years. And you can see that it's increasing everywhere. In fact, it's just to show that we are far from the crisis. I remember, because you know I'm an old guy now, and I started l'Observatoire in 2002. I was responsible for l'Observatoire, but, but before I used to present surveys. And I, re I remember that marks were very low. Uh, when we spoke about moral, when we spoke about... I lost something, no. Uh, it was always bad, now it's better and better, and so we are far from the crisis. Let's have a look at, I think it's about millennials, and it's the same question about the global perception, and you can see that it's better for millennials. It's good, it's good to see that, because the future is with millennials. Okay, and so we can see that the global perception is better. But to be fully honest, and especially in Central Europe, it's much more easier for young people today than by the past. Today, they don't have to fight unemployment. If you are young, in Bulgaria, in Romania, in Slovakia, in Central Europe, well-educated, with a good level at school, and if you speak English, it's not so difficult to find a, a job. You know, it's much more easier than in France. In France, you can have a very high level, and it's difficult to find a job. I, in uh, Central Europe, when we have a look at unemployment, it's decreasing. When we have a look at GDP, it's increasing. So the global situation is good. And for millennials, they are they understand that it's better and better. And so that's why you can see that marks are better for millenniums for the global perception than for the world population. Now it's slide number eight. I just have to check because uh, for me it's difficult to, <laughs> to understand. Let's have a look on the individual perception. You see that for Bulgaria, it's five. And remember, it was 3.6. So, when I speak with someone in Bulgaria, the individual perception is good, and the global perception is not good. Okay, and you can see that it's the case everywhere. And you have the evolution of the mark. It was 5.4 in 2016, and it's increasing to 5.4. Dub seven. I remember 10 years ago, it was below five. So it's better and better. You can see the evolution for five years. Okay, Alors, of course, for Bulgaria, we only have two, two years. But now it will be uh, easier and easier to, to follow the evolution. And as I said, we started with uh, Sweden and Norway. 
The slide number 10, it's about millennials. And you can see that in Bulgaria, we are close to the average. So there is a huge difference between the world population and millennials in Bulgaria. It's good for the future, and it will be my conclusion. Of course, we can think that, okay, in Bulgaria, it's better and better for young people, so it will be good for the business. But in fact, they want to consume, uh, but they are, the level of expectation is really high. And so that's sure that the potential is here to do a lot of things, but we have all together to be better and better. And the competition is really high level today. Let's have a look. It's the purchasing power. I remember three or four years ago, it was the key question. Everywhere the purchasing power was decreasing, but it was not true. In fact, it was a kind of perception because the budget, the nature of budget is changing. You know, in the 90s, a family with two children. In fact, the family used to have only one phone. Today, the same family, it's four mobile, one phone at house, it's internet, uh, TV channels, and so at the end of the day, it's a lot of money in the budget. And so now we understand that the nature of the budget is changing. And in fact, it was not the case five years ago. In fact, we had in mind that we have less money to buy food or, to, uh, or for the car. But now it's something natural. And so be careful. Uh, we have to differentiate between perception and the reality. And today, we can see that the purchasing power, the perception is increasing by 6%. And the fact that it's decreasing, it's minus 6. And you can see that it's much more better for millennials. Here you can see, country by country, the evolution of the purchasing power. For Bulgaria, plus nine, thinking that the purchasing power is increasing. Minus 10, it's decreasing. So it's okay. But, and as I said, today, thanks to a big decrease of unemployment, that's sure that it's easier to speak about the purchasing power. Uh, you know, it's not the same in France, in Spain, in Portugal, because the level of unemployment is high. In France, it's close to 9 or 10 percent. I think in, uh, in Bulgaria, it's below 6 percent. You, you see the main difference between Central Europe and South Europe. In France, the GDP is increasing by 1.5, perhaps close to 2 this year. In Bulgaria, it's 4. The private consumption is increasing by 4% in, uh, in Bulgaria. In France, perhaps it's, uh, it's one and a half. Okay. And regarding unemployment, it's close to 9 or 10 in France, and it's below 6 in Bulgaria. And I'm sure if I look only in Sofia, perhaps it's uh, 3 or 4%. So it's not the same situation. And so the perception in terms of purchasing power is better and better. And the last slide really important for retailers is to see if people would like to save money or want to consume. And you can see that in Bulgaria, 69% would like to consume more and 36 to save money. Okay? And you can see that it's the case everywhere in Central Europe. You can see Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania. In fact, people would like to, to consume, perhaps to be close to the way of flight in, uh, in Western Europe. I don't know. So it's good news. But now uh, we have to be sure that we know how to answer customer needs and customer expectations. To go fast, last century, it was about only stone shops with more and more in services. In 2000, we discovered internet, and it was purchasing online. And today, in fact, the key question is to combine online and offline. And in fact, the key question is digital at store. 
and also social media. So the potential is here, but now we have to find a way to reach it, and it's not so easy. So to conclude, globally the context is good. We know that the potential is here. Now we have to find solutions to be better and better. And of course, it's key for the retail, but it's also key for the banking industry. We will see with José, we will see with uh, Plamen, uh, that of course, beginning of 2000, we were thinking that perhaps stone shop could disappear. It's not the case. And we can think also about branches for bank. It's the same story. And now we have to find ways to develop everywhere. Okay, I think it was the last slide for, for me. I will give the floor to José. We'll speak about, you see, millenniums, yes. Okay, and then Plamen about retail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. So, I'm José Saloyo, CEO of BNP Paribas Personal Finance Bulgaria Brunch. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. I'm going to present you the millennials, what, how they are perceived by their elders, what they want, and how they feel about the future. Just before to start, I would like to do a confidence to you. I'm not a millennial. <laughs> I was born before 1980. But reading the study and analyzing the observatoire, I saw that I'm sharing some common vision, common perception, and common expectation as a client. So what I propose you at the end of the presentation that we'll do with the plan is to share what is also your expectation, you, journalists, employees, partners, as a client, what will be your perception and expectation. And we'll have at the end of the presentation to share it during the break what will be your expectation as a client, okay? So, let's start with the first slide about millennials and how they are perceived by their elders and how they are perceived by themselves. We can see on the right side harsh judgment by the over 35 about the way they qualified the millennial. Lazy materialist, individualist, immature. At the inverse, on the left side, the millennials consider their generation as hardworking, responsible, ambitious, creative. Clearly, big discre discrepancy between both generations. But when we ask them on the next slide, what are the things very important for them? We can see that both of the generation, millennials, are sharing common value as family, but putting more importance on living, reading, traveling, and feeling. So now, if we ask to millennial, to European on the next slide, to European, how they feel, if they feel more optimistic or pessimistic about the future, I can tell you very good news. Overall, are more optimistic. And Bulgarians are among the most optimistic, with 70%. Only French, Pascal, are more pessimistic. <laughs> And when we ask the same question to millennials on the next slide, we can see that are even more optimistic. And Bulgarians among the most optimistic, with 83% of them optimistic. And what is interesting is that 35% of Bulgarians state that on the last 12 months, they increase their purchase power. And this confirms one of the points mentioned by the observatoire, is that the positive vision is reflected on the positive purchase intention. That's positive for the market, positive for European market, and positive for Bulgarian market. So, 
this sure better increase huge intention of purchase, but when we ask them what will be their attitude vis-à-vis -vis of this consumption, clearly, yes, they want to consume, but with a reasonable and responsible attitude, responsible consumption. That's clearly responsible, transparent, solution adapted to their project, adapted to their need. It's clearly what BNP Paribas Personal Finance Bugal Branch propose today to our client. So this is really important. And we have, as a consumer lending company, really huge experience when we're talking about BNP Paribas Personal Finance Bugal Branch. We are talking about clients. We are talking about database of 1.5 million clients on which already half of them use more than twice our service. So clearly, positive, interesting study, positive vision about the Europe, about millennials. So now I propose you to let the floor to Plamen, who is going to present you the relation between the millennials and the shop. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Floor is Bonjour, Melissa. Здравейте. Аз съм Пламен. Жозе открадна част от моята първа реплика. I am a millennial. You partially stole my pickup line. I am still a millennial. Обаче аз ще продължим на български. Темата, която имам удоволствието да представя предвид състоянието на нейния дялко и нейният глас е милениумите и магазините и добрите чувства. Започваме с това. Въпросът удоволствие ли е шопингът? тъй като в различните държави можем да видим, че хората го възприемат по различен начин. Общо за европейците, шопингът е удоволствие като процент 47% дали такъв отговор, като за българите това е доста по-високо възприятие като удоволствие от пазаруването, 53%. Но също забелязваме и при въпроса задължение ли е шопинга за хората. Тук отново българите го възприемат по-силно като задължение спрямо европейците. Интересно можем да видим за останалите държави, че най-голямо удоволствие явно изпитат от шопинга в Италия, а най-малко го възприемат като задължение в Румъния. Това са някои по-така интересни факти. Продължаваме нататък. На въпроса всъщност какво мислят милениумите по този въпрос? Можем да видим в дясно със свето сино са отговорите на милениумите, че те възприемат шопинга много повече като удоволствие спрямо останалата база от клиенти. Но а, още по-интересното е, че българските милениуми, които са най-вдясно, дават още по-силен отговор по този въпрос. Но пък а, за тях е малко, по, а, малко повече задължение, отколкото останалите милениуми. Въпреки това можем да видим, че милениумите много повече изпитват удоволствие от шопинга спрямо средната извадка за Европа. На въпроса а, какви са предимствата на физическите магазини и как те влияят на хората, когато пазаруват, а, можем да видим, че всички хора, участвали в извадката, а, са силно повлияни от това да могат да пипнат продукта, да го видят, да го изпробват. Като българите и милениумите тук са още по-зависими от а, тези неща. Интересното обаче е, че българите и милениумите в България са малко по-резервирани от гледна точка на това дали ще получат съвет от консултант-продавач или не. Тоест малко по-резервирани сме тук. Продължаваме с това какви всъщност са предимствата на пазаруването в традиционен магазин спрямо пазаруването в интернет. Разбира се, на първо място е това, че можеш да видиш продукта, да го пипнеш, да се докоснеш до него и съответно да го вземеш веднага с теб по дома или където искаш да отидеш. Това са най-чести отговори на всички групи изследвания в получването, милениуми, хора на възраст 35+, и цялата извадка за Европа. Това, което тук е по-интересно, че за българските милениуми а, на второ място по интерес идва това те да могат да тестват продукта, не само да го видят, но да го изпробват. Едва след това за тях а, е възможността те да го вземат веднага. А, нещо, което преди малко засегнахме и е ясно видимо и тук, а, възможността да получат съвет от консултант или информация е много, а, много малко засегната в а, отговорите на милениумите, а в отговорите на милениумите в България още по-малко засегната което потвърждава и предишната информация. Така, продължаваме с това всъщност къде 
искат да пазаруват милениумите. Разбира се, ми се ясно за всички, те предпочитат големите търговски центрове и предимно места, където могат да получат нещо допълнително като преживяване, освен самия шопинг, естествено големите търговски центрове. А, това, което прави впечатление е тук, че а, всички а, изследвани хора проявяват еднакъв интерес или привързаност към това да пазаруват в големи вериги, специализирани магазини, големите хранителни вериги, но пък милениумите в България имат по-голям афинитет към малките квартални магазинчета и аутлет центровете спрямо милениумите а, в другите страни и останалата извадка. Така, тук нещо много интересно, близка до мен тема. Следващия слайд. Този го приключихме така. Дигиталните технологии. Не можем да говорим за милениум поколението и пазаруване и да не говорим за диджитал. Разбира се, това е поколението, което е свикнало напълно с диджитал технологиите, трендовете и те са част от тяхното преживяване като купувачи, потребители. Uh, като най-видимо тук е, че милениумите изключително много залагат на това, над останалата извадка от хора. Uh, не бих казал зависими, но доста силно проявено е при тях, спрямо всички останали. Интересно е, uh, че за българските милениуми е много по-голям дел на отговори, които казват, че обичат да ресърчват или да проучват продукти онлайн, след което да отидат да си го закупят в някой физически магазин или така наречения ропо ефект. В продължение на същата тема, дигиталните технологии, преживяване и така нататък, не можем да споменем, че да не споменем, че милениумите са силно привързани към социалните мрежи и присъствието на търговците там е изключително важно за тях. Тук виждаме, че отговорите на милениумите спрямо всяка друга извадка са почти двойно по-изявени. Uh, говорим най-общо казано за следене на търговец или магазин в социалните мрежи, продукти, които качват видеа за тези продукти, uh, дискусии относно тези продукти и така нататък. Но милениумите абсолютно ясно се вижда, че е много повече двойно дори залагат на социалните мрежи спрямо останалите възрастови групи. Uh, Говоряки за пазаруването и онлайн, uh, нека видим uh, Сашо следващия слайд, моля те. Следващия слайд. Нека видим всъщност каква част от европейците пазаруват стрикли онлайн или а, изцяло онлайн. Тук забелязахме нещо интересно. Най-долу може да видите делът на милениумите, които пазаруват а, изцяло или само онлайн. А, в тези сини правоъгълничета може да видите делът на хората, които пазаруват изцяло онлайн, извън тази група. А, това, което прави впечатление е, че разликите са много малки. Т.е. милениумите не изпреварват, кой знае колко останалите възрастови групи по това дали пазаруват изцяло онлайн. Като най-често се пазаруват естествено продукти от културен характер, музика, книги, билети за събития и така нататък. Като милениумите също така много обичат да пазаруват само онлайн дрехи, стоки за спорт и развлечения, както и продукти за хигиена и красота. Статистиката е много полезна за нещо друго. Вижда се как има определени групи от стоки, които се пазаруват предимно в традиционните магазини, тъй като явно клиента има нужда да види и наистина да се докосне от тези продукти. Мебели, хранителни стоки и продукти от сферата на прави си сам, които са малко по-специфични. След като поговорихме за онлайн пазаруването, Даваме една друга извадка, която показва, че според европейците много голяма част от тях считат, че в близките години физическите магазини ще изчезнат или ще се променят. Тук по-интересното е, че българите, може да видите, дават още по-силен атестат за това, а милениумите и по-специално българските милениуми са още по-обедени, че физическите магазини или ще се променят или ще изчезнат в бъдеще. В подкрепа на тази статистика даваме още нещо. Около 70% от европейците считат, че в близките 10 години магазините корено ще се променят, тъй като все пак те ще се опитат да оцелеят в пазарната среда. Отново тук българите и милениумите най-вдясно, а най-вгоре вдясно българските милениуми са още по-обедени, че това ще се случи и магазините наистина ще се променят. 
Продължаваме с това, кои всъщност са недостатъците на физическите магазини според поручването на нашата компания. Независимо от групата хора, къде живеят или тяхната възраст, всички посочват на първо място загубата на време и чакането. Това е нещо, което явно дразни всички. А, също така липсата на личност на продуктите. Тук а, отговорите като съотношения са много близки. А, няма някакви огромни разминавания. На там се направи впечатление нещо друго, че при милениумите много малко те отдава значение на това дали ще получат а, всъщност а, помощ или консултация от продавач, консултанти, дали той е квалифициран или не. А при българските милениуми най-вдясно най това се проявява дори двойно. Те още по-малко считат това за нужно и важно за тях. Какви всъщност обаче са очакванията на милениумите за магазините от тук нататък? Какво искате да се случи? А, разбира се, както казахме по-рано, те очакват магазините да им предложат нещо допълнително. Нещо извън това, те просто да си купят някаква стока. Те разчитат на някакво допълнително преживяване, което да им бъде предоставено и допълнително удобство. Да се предлагат нови технологични сензорни преживявания, да има места за отдих и релаксация, такива като за релакс. А, да се предлагат развлекателни дейности, които наистина да забавляват хората покрай това, че те ще пазаруват нещо. Отново видимо е, че българите а, спрямо от основната извадка и а, милениумите дават още по-високи резултати, т.е. техните очаквания са още по-силни за тези, към тези изисквания. Друго, което очакват а, милениумите и не само те, естествено са бързина, да губят по-малко време в магазина, което е свързано и с удобства на плащанията и по-голяма гъвкавост. А, това е нещо, което в много голям процент се очаква от всички, почти 90%, като милениумите и милениумите в България дори над 92%, т.е. те много разчитат на различни гъвкави и бързи методи на плащане. Нещо друго, което тук сме а, видяли, е, че има много силно очакване към това, когато отидеш на каса или в магазин, да не се сканират всички твои продукти един по един, а да имаш възможност всичко да се случи наведнъж, да си платиш бързо и просто да си тръгнеш. Отново тук, българските милениум са с изключително високи очаквания за такова нещо. И разбира се, но не на последно място, всички хора очакват в бъдеще магазините да им предлагат повече достъпност, удобство. Като, например, места за паркиране, да можеш да си запазиш място още преди да си отишъл да пазаруваш. Да има детски кътове, където да оставиш децата си и да има кой да ги гледа, разбира се. Но най-интересното е, че тук отново, както беше засегнато и в предишни извадки, е, че хората много разчитат на по-дълго време, по-дълго работно време на магазините и отново българите и милениумите с много по-силни очаквания в тази посока. Това е за момента от мен. Сега връщам думата на господин Жозе Салойо, за да направи заключение по темата. Жозе. Thank you, Plemen. Good Thank you. So to conclude, as it was mentioned by uh, by Pascal and we saw on different slide, we are supported by comfortable and positive environment. That sure, and this we can see Europe more and more optimistic and positive about their perception, about the future, about themselves. So this is clearly positive for us, and Bulgarian among the most optimistic. So, and as mentioned by the observatoire, and as I said, positive vision is reflected on the positive purchase intention. Now, due to the fact that millennials are the one entering on the working sphere, active life, and the fact that millennials are the generation that is going to increase their purchase power, we can clearly see that with their positive attitude, we are going to increase the power of purchase, and this will be positive for the economic environment. So, positive for us, positive for the market, positive for Bulgarian, with Bulgarian, uh, again I say, and millennials, more positive and optimistic about the future. So this is really positive. So now, if I come back on the presentation of, uh, of Plamen, about the behavior of the millennials. I will ask you a question about if millennials are more digital, 
you are going to answer to me? Yes, of course. They will continue to compare, they will continue to buy on the internet using social media. If I ask you if millennials are going only to buy on online, no. Even if internet is widespread and in Bulgaria is, is increasing, we saw that shopping is a real pleasure for them. And now if I ask you if millennials expect the shop to evolve, yes, and not only millennials, but all the generation want to feel and to live experience. So this clearly, strong majority of Europeans is expect the shop to evolve. Physical shop to be original, sharing space, testing, and feeling living experience. So this is clearly the message that we saw on this presentation, on the observatoire. And again, what is really important on one of the message is that we have a physical shop, we have online shop, all together they will move, all together one of them will support together, and they are completely linked with the full fluidity on the shopping experience. And what is important, and what you mentioned, is that it's without any friction, any perturbation on this customer experience, starting from the accessibility for the payment and during all the life that we have with our client. So we saw easy, fluidity, responsible. These are must that we need to provide to our client, that we need to provide to millennials and to all the generation. And this is clearly what we propose today to our client, this fluidity, this customer experience, this shopping experience. And I will take a second point. That is what we mentioned about to be able to provide this on both channels, online and physical, and both are linked. It's what I call omni-channel, omni-contact. And this is really important. This physical contact that we have in BNP Paribas Personal Finance Bulgaria branch with more than 3,000 locations, including 45 branches, but also the one that we propose in remote, via phone, via email, emails, but also via digital contact form e-commerce, which represent already 30% of our demands. Clearly, we see that it's, it's a must. We need and we are going to continue to invest to give the best experience, not the better. We need to give the best customer experience, accessibility, financing payment during all the life. So this is what we are going to do. And with you, partner, it's what we are going to work with you in order to go to this direction. So really interesting, and it was really interesting for us to read this observatoire. I hope and I'm sure it was also interesting for all of you. So we finish the presentation. I propose you now to go to Q&A session with uh, Nelly, and uh, you have some uh, information to give. Please. Thank you very much. Аз също се работи ли? Да. Здравейте на всички. Аз също се надявам презентацията да ви е била изключително интересна, защото темата за милениумите ни занимава от известно време и ще ни продължи да ни занимава и в бъдещето. Щеше ми се, докато слушам тук да имам възможност наистина за да надникна само за секунда след 10 години какво ще бъде, но за съжаление нямаме тази възможност. Ще споделя с вас какво сте отговорили на четирите въпроса. Въобще ли ни извода е, че няма голяма разлика между това, което видяхме като информация на слайдовете и това, което сте посочили вие като настроение от присъстващите тук. Също мога да кажа, че бължинството от хората, които сте тук, сте оптимистично настроени за нашето бъдеще, което е един 
супер, супер положително послание по отношение на това дали след 10 години ще изчезнат магазините и ще остане пазаруването само онлайн. Бълшинството от вас също смятат около, малко около 70%, че магазините ще продължават да съществуват, но най-вероятно всички вярваме, че ще се трансформират. Като основен недостатък на сегашните физически магазини и ние споделяме, както и останалите хора, които са били интервюирани, че това е чакането на опашките. Определено ще се работи сигурно в тази посока хората, които имат физически магазини. И какво искаме да. Какво, какво очакваме от магазините в настоящия момент? за да се увеличи желанието да ги посещаваме повече. Респективно тук отговора е да се плаща по-бързо и отново е синхрон отговора на хората в тази зала с отговорите, които видяхме. Така че ние сме част от е, хората, които са дали тези отговори. И сега благодаря ви за вниманието. Ще преминем към е, секцията с въпроси. Uh, няма звук на, на моя микрофон. <coughs> да, благодаря. Uh, така, uh, дами и господа, uh, може да се задават въпросите по два начина. Както видяхте, един вариант е през платформата Слайдо, другия вариант е в uh, залата имаме микрофон. Ето е лице с uh, микрофона, така че колегите от медиите, ако искате, можете да uh, поискате да uh, зададете въпрос. И така, uh, заповядайте за въпроси. Надявам се, че тя, информацията беше много, да не е била твърда много, за да, да няма въпроси накрая. Ако искате, а, за да дам възможност хората да си помислят, да започнем с един от въпросите, а, от, а, които са ни зададени през слайдо. Може би не ли първи въпрос, дали би отговорил? Втория, добре? Нека на втория да го отговорим. А, т.е. въпросът да е колко с... от клиентите ви са милениуми? Да, нека да започнем с втория въпрос. То е много интересно всъщност да разберем а... колко, каква е реална част от клиентите а, всъщност а, има тези очаквани претенции към. Ние от няколко света. години в а, БНП пари лични финанси предлагаме а, кандидатстване онлайн и към момента а, мога да споделя, че около 30% от а, заявленията, които идват онлайн са в... А, категорията на, на милениумите, с тенденция това да се увеличава, разбира се. Може би още една интересна тенденция, която е много характерна за България, се оказа, че а, кандидатстващите а, избират а, мобилните устройства, смарт-телефоните, което лично мен доста ме изненада, защото видяхме едно сравнение как стои България спрямо останалите страни в а, нашия регион, който Паскал в началото а, изреди Румъния, Чехия, Словакия и Унгария. И в България ясно има тенденция, че много повече от българите а, ползват за а, подобни услуги мобилните си устройства, в сравнение с примерно едни чехи а, и словаци. При нас е 70, над 70%, а там е а под, а, под 50, ако не ме лъже. Тоест чувствителна беше разликата. Със сигурност при нас а, тенденциите са за много по-сериозно използване на мобилните устройства. Добре. А, тъй като има а, гласували за <съща> за третия въпрос, а, според вас, кога търговците в Европа и тези в България ще интегрират дигитално изживяване в физическата среда? Само секунда за да направят клиентското изживяване по-добро. Кой ще отговори на този въпрос? Аз мога да опитам да дам моето ме въпроса. Да, да, смисля, че не ли... а, доста от търговците а, Опитват и работят а, само онлайн. Даже и в а, залата има представители на, на такива търговци. А, определено това е бъдещето, но а, истината е, че в момента забелязваме тази нужда на хората да физически да контактнат. И а, дори големи компании, които развиват само онлайн, 
А, търговията все пак а, иска да, раз, да открият и а, точки, където ще има възможност за физически контакти. Така че, кога ми върви и в момента този процес, то не е нещо, което ще се случи утре или в бъдещето, ами и в момента се, а, се случва. Всъщност то, това бъдеще, което го очакваме, то в момента се случва около, около нас. Uh, Maybe just uh, I will complete that some. On what we need to focus is this customer experience. After we can talk about digital, about innovation, but we need to focus on this customer experience. And we saw especially for Bulgarian to go to the shop, it's a real pleasure. And uh, this is really specific to Bulgarian market. They like to go to the big shop, commercial. So the main idea is really to, <coughs> to propose some sensation emotion in the shop, testing, sharing experience. So this is on what we need to work with our partner, with you, in order to propose the best experience. So this is really the focus, and after this will address millennials, but we also address all the generation. So that's main focus on what we need to work with, uh, with you. And we'll be part of this experience, because consumer is also to give to easy access to the goods, and to improve access, to improve the standard of living. So, and we need to be completely integrated on this what I call shopping experience, but also this customer experience. So this, I think, is the main focus on which that we need to, uh, to work and to focus. But in, in fact, today, uh, in fact, it started everywhere because uh, it started on the food market with the drive, with the click and collect, uh, every retailer has a, w has a website. And in fact, the only way we have to behave is to think about that uh, a client can research online and purchase online, can research online and purchase offline, can research offline and purchase online, and can research offline and purchase offline. It's not so difficult. So we have to be everywhere. And I think that the The next battle will be with conversational. Conversational is how to use uh, social media, how to use Messenger, as to how to use WhatsApp to, to deliver transactions. And it's not so easy. Because, you know, for, for the moment, uh, Google is the king on the website. In fact, if you want to be uh, well, uh, if you want to, to have a good reference month, you have to. To, to deal with Google. And perhaps tomorrow you will have to do the same with WhatsApp, with messengers, because everywhere will be within a kind of application. And it will be the future. And for the moment, okay, Google, I think that's, uh, Nicola, uh, 80% of people are using Google today? 80? Uh, it depends. Uh, in the US, when you look for a product, it's, uh, first of all, it's 58% on Amazon. Ah, okay, we'll be Then it's Google. It's But Google. In, in Europe? In Western Europe, uh, the first uh, search engine is Google, yes. Yeah. And so tomorrow it's key because we, what to do with, uh, with our brand? What to do with our tools? Is it better to, to spend a lot of money on the brand? Or is it easier to, to deal with uh, Facebook or to, get, uh, to go to Messenger or to WhatsApp? I don't know. Uh, do we have to invest a lot of money on tools? Or, t or is it better to use tools from uh, uh, GAFA? It will be the next battle. But for the moment, digital is everywhere. And, uh, and uh, uh, digital, in fact, digital in store is, is the key. But sure that. You know, everything is, move, is moving very fast. Uh, we just have to imagine that we discovered internet in 2000 in Europe. <coughs> 2000, it's less than 20 years. And today we are thinking about the next step. It's completely crazy because, we, you know, the real uh, distribution started in 1963 in France with Carrefour, with the hypermarket. And we wait for 40 years, in fact, to move to, to something else. And now, every five years, we have to change. And so... Uh, Uh, it's really, really difficult to know what will be the future. But it started everywhere. Благодаря. Сега на въпроса за методите за плащане, мисля да го оставя за следващия Q&A в бъдещето, тъй като Николай ще говори на тази тема. Но мисля, че можем в момента да вземем под внимание този въпрос, какво предвижда BNP Pariba Personal Finance, лични финанси, да в бизнес модела си, за да отговори на очакванията на милениумите? Uh, 
Um, I can start if you want start to, to add something. Uh, Elders to start. <laughs> Uh, in fact, we, we know that we have to move from uh, a classic business model to, uh, to digital, that's sure. After, we have to know if we have to move from a classic model to digital banking or only to digital CTLM or BNP Paribas Personal Finance. As you know, we started in Czech Republic with Elo Bank. We decided to move from CTLM to Elo Bank. Uh, not only to be digital, but also to offer uh, current account savings because we are thinking it's, it's a way, uh, sorry, to, uh, <coughs> to keep clients. Uh, but that's sure that we have something, a, a big asset in Bulgaria because we have branches. You know, everywhere, and especially in France, a lot of traditional banks would like to close branches because it's too expensive and because it's possible to do everything online. But in fact, it's not so easy because the client would like also to go to branches. And so you just have to, to find the, the, the right way. And for example, if you watch uh, French TV, you will see advertising for Hello Bank. So Hello Bank is digital banking uh, within BNP Paribas. And the advertising can say, but you know, if you want, you can go to the branch for a better uh, service. So we know that now we need both pillars, digital and branches. And we are really lucky because we have branches in, uh, in Bulgaria. You know, it's not the case in Czech Republic. In Czech Republic, we started with Elo Bank without branches. We have three branches. Okay, in Prague, uh, Ostrava and Barno. Uh, we are lucky because we are working with, uh, with a lot of partners uh, on retail. So it's, uh, it's a way also to be uh, to be seen at the point of sale, but that's sure that we will have to, to find a way to mix digital and branches. After, we will have to compete with uh, new, new actors about payment, uh, about data. And you know, uh, the most difficult for us is to fight uh, regulation, in fact. It's really, really difficult to do our job. We don't know how to use data. Uh, perhaps you know that we are working on GDPR, it's another way to, to use data, so we need consents. We are also, uh, we are working also on uh, PSD2 about payment, and it's more and more difficult, and you, and you have a lot of uh, startup working on payment, but you know it's, for payment, it's not possible to be the far west, huh? sometimes we, we, need, we need rules. And so now, uh, we are s working on the strategy, but it's not only about what to do to be close to millennials or what to do to be close to our clients. It's also how to uh, follow the regulation and also to be customer oriented. It's not, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. But we are working uh, on that. And I think that we will have several business models. When I was at the communications department 10 years ago, we were thinking that the best way was to have a CTLM everywhere, it was the same business model and everything uh, will be okay. But it's not the case. It's not the case, in fact, we have to take into account uh, uh, each country. Uh, sometimes we are too really good with partners on the B2B side and sometimes we are better on the B2C side and sometimes we are better on the automotive market, we don't know. And so it's possible to, do, to mix business uh, models and to have several uh, commercial brands. But you know, uh, 10 years ago, here, I uh, should say uh, something different. So, <laughs> so uh, OK, so we are working on that. I don't know if you want to, to say something else, but uh, maybe just. I think one of the points that you, you mentioned is that uh, different channel. And for me, this is really important that all have to be linked. So if someone is starting on the internet and after he go to the physical, you need to know the same client. He doesn't have to repeat the same thing. So this, what I call this omnichannel customer, should be part of our process and what we propose to the client. And to, tomorrow you can start also for the physical one and to go to online. So these are, should be completely linked. So this is not only physical or digital. We saw that both of them are combined. So what we need to propose is this link together and it should be transparent, transparent for our client in order to give this expand. So this, I think it's what you mentioned on the different way, new behavior of our client. And we should, with you, partner, to work on it in order to give this transparency and fluidity uh, to, uh, to our client. 
And if I come back just on, on the question, and for me, we can talk about innovation, but what is really important for also for, we saw for millennials, it's some pillars as security, security of payment. Because if you don't bring the security of payment, first, you will not use the tool, because it's not because it's nice that if you have a beautiful house, house but you don't have the foundation and it's strong, you are not going to live inside. So this is the same for the service that we provide, because we are responsible is to give this security of payment because we have a flexible car with secure payment that we provide to our client. So this is really mandatory for us. When I'm talking about security, it's financial security. Today we propose fixed interest rate with monthly in installment. There is no additional fee, something that can happen tomorrow. It's something that we propose, so it's this financial security that we propose to our client today. So this for me are really the, the, the basic this responsible that we want to bring. After, we need to take this social media, so this, sure, it will be used tomorrow, so we need to be inside, we need to understand, but I think this is positive because this will be the voice of the customer. Because at the end, we can discuss what we want, but what the client expect from us, from you, tomorrow, today and tomorrow. So for me, this social network, it's also the way to collect this information we already are doing in our company, we take the voice, we contact client during all the process, during all the relation with us, we contact the client to know how we can improve, how we can give a better service to the client. So for me, this is what they expect, and we are going to work on it. And this is mandatory, it's really main point for millennials, but also for all the other generation. But we'll focus more on two, two millions on this part. That's mandatory. If you don't propose, you're out, <coughs> clearly. Благодаря, Жозе. А, дами и господа, аз предлагам, тъй като сме 20 минути, а, с 20 минути закъснение, да, на този етап да приключим с Q&A. А, след а, Никола имаме още една възможност. Затова нека да благодарим на хората, които днес а, презентираха до сега, до този момент. Тук благодаря ви. Thank you. Thank you. А, и бих искал да поканя господин Никола Диакуно, а, от, който е експерт от а, Института за дигитален маркетинг Лешенжор на BNP Paribas Personal Finance в Париж. Заповядай, Никола. Окей, първо от всичко, това е всичко приятел да бъде тук. Това е моят първо време в София и ще го направя. И това ще бъде първо време в Сърсия. So we're going to start uh, the presentation about uh, the latest trend that we uh, analyze and uh, decode from uh, uh, the, the beginning of uh, 2018. So what I try to offer you is a time travel uh, 10 years from now, what's going on in uh, 2028 or even 2030. So we've a uh, life reloaded presentation. Um, first, millennials or Gen Z, you have to choose your side. If you go to uh, a lot of conferences now, they are talking about the next generation, the Gen Z, the kids uh, under 20 years old that I um, wish I would still be in. Um, but still, uh, nobody really understands uh, what they're saying, what they want. Uh, same thing for millennials and for uh, uh, Gen Z, because they have such different behaviors that we are used to. Uh, and that's why it's very, very important to understand how they behave, what they think, and what the, at the value that they, they praise, and what they wait for as a services. And that really starts now, because they're going to have a big impact on commerce in the next 10 years. Because 10 years from now, Gen Z and millennials will represent two-thirds of the population worldwide. So that's the customers of tomorrow. And first thing, that's uh, figures from uh, the US and the Western Europe. Um, most of them, they use Amazon on their mobile. That's where they go to shop to look for products, even though they still praise to go uh, shop offline. And as mentioned earlier, they're king for messaging application. They go on Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Viber, Snapchat, whatever you use. Who's on? instant messaging application such like Messenger, Viber, WhatsApp, or Snapchat. Okay, see? And, uh, but they are slightly different uh, between the both generation. Uh, Gen Z, 
are very keen to privacy, which is not already the case for millennials. First of all, they want to turn off the geolocation. They don't want to receive notification. They, want to, they don't want to be tracked. Um, they're very future-oriented uh, as millennials live the present day. They are still very, uh, as mentioned, millennials were optimist. Uh, Gen Z are more realist, uh, realistic uh, about what's going on, and they want to work for their own success. And they are very keen into uh, politics, engagement, uh, environment, and social uh, engagement as well. And as I said, Gen Z, so you know, the kids under 20, they will be 2.6 billion by 2020, um, and 92% of them go online on a daily basis, and most of them use their mobile. And what scares me the most is that they think Facebook is a media, not a social network. So they take all the information that they see on Facebook for granted, which is kind of scary. Because you know that if you're on Facebook, all the information that you receive are just because they fit your needs and what you like to. So you just have a small amount of small view of what's going on for in the real world that depend on you. So there is, uh, uh, I would say, a bias about uh, what's going on thanks to the artificial intelligence behind Facebook that pushes only what you like. Uh, and they prefer Snapchat to SMS to stay in contact with their, their friends. Also, when they are on the mobile, they love to chat and to text all the time. I don't know if you've seen uh, under 20 people uh, sending messages. It goes so fast. It's like they are doing uh, uh, lifting with their thumb uh, on a gym, uh, so then they can uh, type very, very fast on their mobile phone. And they love to play games. And that's really key, and you see uh, along the presentation, that gaming is a big trend to follow for brands and to, for sponsorship and to be in the heart of uh, uh, Gen Z. And they even use their mobile to do uh, schoolwork. Um, I don't know if for some of you guys were there uh, last November or, or two years ago, uh, I showed a lot of videos about Amazon Echo uh, and voice assistant, so there's Google Home as well. Uh, we had uh, one French kid uh, at our conference in Paris, 10 years old. Uh, is using Google Home voice assistant within his home to do his homework. So he's as talking to a, a speaker to help him do his homework at home. And he's 10 years old. So he's already into the voice uh, economy that uh, was mentioned by uh, uh, Pascal earlier. So what they do, they go a lot on YouTube. They think YouTube is the best way to gain knowledge. Every time they have a problem, they just go on YouTube to see if there is a video to help them solve the problem. Uh, and they cannot, for 50% of them, they cannot live without YouTube. How scary is that? They think the truth is on YouTube. When you see all the dumbest videos, uh, not only kitties and, and dogs and cute dogs, but uh, some scary stuff. Um, and you see, and 18% of the time they, sp they spend on Twitch. Are you guys aware of what Twitch is? Yeah. Some of you, some gamers in there, it's so cool. Uh, so Twitch is a streaming platform where you go to watch other people play video games. But I mean, you may think it's stupid, but who watch football game on TV? Will play po people doing sports? That's exactly the same thing you watch people do something else. Uh, and uh, young people are just big into that. Uh, and that's the future of entertainment. And Twitch has been bought by Amazon. And they have a lot of influence into the spending of the household. 77% of food and beverage is influenced by Gen Z because we all know they don't like vegetables. Uh, and what is very interesting is that today, in advertising, most of the time we target uh, the mother, the father, and the one who owns uh, the money. But we should maybe think about targeting the one who influence the buying. Because when you're going to buy a new couch, your teenager is going to tell you, this one is ugly, I want this one, and you're going to buy this one, most of the time. 
uh, and so on and so on. So that's very interesting that they influence a lot all the spendings of the household. So that's going to have impact in store. But as mentioned earlier, stores never going to die, especially because Gen Z, 98% of them, they still want to go in stores. But they want to go in stores to buy online. So that's why the business model of stores has to change towards experience and customization. Here at Nike, um, they changed the store from uh, last year. The, the first row was dedicated to uh, customization. So I could buy the uh, Air Force One white, that is here, here we go. Um, and then I can uh, take an appointment with the designer, a stylist, just to customize my shoes. That is made to uh, attract millennials and Gen Z because they are big sneakers fans and they want to have uh, unique shoes. They don't want the same shoes as other people. So here you have no uh, extra cost and you can customize as you want your, your goods. Also here with the uh, red picture here, it's a basketball jersey with a smart tag in it. So which means that, I don't know if you follow the uh, NBA and the uh, basketball games, but if you have the jersey, I'll say of Kevin Durant, for instance, then you can tap your phone on the jersey and you will have the highlights of the previous game, all the stats and so on. So then textile and uh, clothing is getting alive and can bring you and push you a new experience and then brings loyalty to the brand as well. Also Nike, they work and marketing is working on politics. You know, they have big issues with Trump in the US. Uh, so here in Nike, they have made a, a launch a campaign named uh, Equality to see and to uh, fight the government, I would say, of the US, saying that there's no differences of where you're from, what's your origin in sports. We are all equal. We are all bad or all good, it depends. Uh, and then, for uh, instance, in New York, they have a, a big store in the Fifth Avenue and they're going to change the location because the building is run by, the, by Trump's company. And they want to fight, they want to give more money to Trump. So then they're going to change the location of the store. So see, because they want also to be uh, appealing to younger generations that just hate Donald Trump. And that's where the customers are. They're not Trump fans. They're against Donald Trump. So they do the same as a marketing plan. What about stores? This one, American Eagle. It's uh, one of my favorites. It's in New York, Union Square, close to the uh, campus of uh, New York University. And here, within the store, if you're a student, you show your student's card and you can do your laundry within the store. While you try on clothes or while you do your homework on the uh, second floor, you have a, a working room here where you can work, you have free Wi-Fi, free water, and you can spend time within the store. It's like bringing services to the com surrounding communities within the stores, and then you bring loyalty, and then when they need to buy clothes, they'll go to the store here, and so on and so on. What about also the fact that brands are going to the streets? Because they lack the relationship be with the customers. Like for instance, Barilla, you know, uh, for pasta, um, they have opened restaurants within New York and Dubai and other big uh, cities uh, in the world, just because they want to get some contacts with their customers as well. Kellogg's for cereals, they have opened a coffee in New York as well, where you can go there and, and take your breakfast and discover all the brands around Kellogg's because they have 21 brands of cereals. And you even have uh, uh, a spot dedicated here where you can create your own uh, cereal and uh, use tools to and take picture and then send it to, Snap to Instagram. I don't know if you guys want to do that, but I've seen some kids doing that. I don't know why, but I don't try to understand. Um, and the future of stores, and that's very, very important because as I said earlier, Gen Z want to go to stores, but 50% of them want to buy online within the store, is the showroom. And that's why Walmart is investing and buying a lot of retailers that are specifically uh, dedicated to showroom stores, like Bonobos or Mode Clothes, because they want to gain knowledge. Because for them, the future of store is about a showroom where you come in, touch the product, try it on, experience it, use it, have some uh, classes about 
for do it yourself, for instance, you take classes about how to paint a wall and stuff like that, and then you buy your line and you get delivered the same day or the day after. Because you don't want to bother shopping with all uh, carrying the, the, the bags and all around the place. You want to get your hands free. Because you know what? The first, when you, when you stop shopping, is when you have too much bags to carry on. So then if you have your hands free, you can still sh shop until midnight, if you wish. Or if you have the money. Um, as mentioned by uh, Pascal, be conversational or die. Especially for young generation. Because millennials, they are into texting, conversation. They use text, but Gen Z, they use emoji. They use images. So be there. Uh, we mentioned that Messenger has opened a platform, uh, WhatsApp, Viber, but even Apple now has launched a, a service named uh, Business Chat, where when you go on Safari, you look for stores, then you will have a bubble here, you click on it, and then you can chat with the brand, with the store manager. If you look for a product, you'll know if it's available. If you want to buy something, uh, you can use Business Chat. So that brings uh, a link between all the owners of uh, iPhones and the brands. That is very big in the US. And then you can even pay within uh, the iMessage application if you have Apple Pay within your iPhone activated. So it is uh, the way people shop. And that's the key trend here about the retail is to be seamless you know, and frictionless because that's killing the customer experience. We have talked a lot about chatbots, you know, the small ro the talking robots that you're going to chat with. All the experiences were not that good. Um, most of the time they need humans, especially for added value questions and tricky questions. So when you launch a chatbot as a brand um, for a retailer or banking, uh, be sure to mix humans and algorithm because algorithm at that time are not going to solve the world. Human are still needed uh, to run it. And uh, so the better way is to mix both. And we have a company named in France, uh, the Social Client, that is very interesting because when you call uh, for an operator, then you start your conversation uh, talking with them, then they can shift it to Messenger, then you can continue, take picture of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, your uh, ID and so on, and then when you call back, they all have the information. That's what you were mentioning, that you don't need to, uh, you need to have the continuity between all the channels about the intention, because you don't want to repeat all the time the same story uh, if you talk to someone uh, different. Here, voice is a new uh, user interface. We are talking about screen, typing with a touch screen, but tomorrow everything is going to be run by voices. Today already, 30% of uh, search on Google is done by voice. You say, hey Google, help me find uh, shoes, and so on. By 2020, 50% of worldwide online search will be made by voice. For Amazon, that's on the right. That's the new user interface that they, were, they are working on. That's why they have launched Amazon Echo with the artificial intelligence uh, Alexa. And voice assistants are everywhere, and they're going to revolutionize commerce. Uh, one third of the people that own an Amazon Echo buy products through voice recognition. 38% of the people that own an Amazon Echo think that Alexa, the artificial intelligence within, it is a friend. I don't know if their life is, but they think that the artificial intelligence is like a friend. So that's the future of commerce. It's already everywhere. If you go to Best Buy or even Fnac or I'm sure here in some stores, uh, electronic stores, you have a specific uh, places dedicated to all the voice assistants that you can find on the market. They have sold over 20 billion Amazon Echo last year in three countries. US, uh, UK, and Germany. That was the top electronic devices sold for Christmas. And now they, it, they announced that they're going to launch a TV. So now tomorrow you're going to be talking to your TV to do your shopping. You're going to say to your TV, okay, buy rice, buy tomatoes, uh, remind me to uh, call my friend tomorrow because that's his birthday, and so on and so on. So that means that it's going to have a big impact about marketing. Because now, when you talk to Google, 
even because you can add uh, some specific uh, application to Amazon Alexa or to Google Home, you can talk to uh, retailers. Uh, say, for, for instance, in France, you can talk to Monoprix. Uh, when you uh, want to shop, you say, okay, uh, hey Google, I want to talk to Monoprix, and then they have uh, specific add-ons uh, on the voice ecosystem. But that means that the voice that you're gonna hear is still the voice of Google. So maybe tomorrow marketers will have to find a personality to their voice assistant that going to carry on the values of the brands. Because if I buy, let's say, tomatoes, I don't want the same voice when I want to buy tomatoes that I'm going to talk to Mercedes or to BMW, because we don't share the same value as a tomato. You know, So that's key for brands to, uh, to uh, take on the ecosystem of voice uh, marketing and to build a specific uh, personality to voice assistants, depending on the brand you're talking to. That's very, very key. Otherwise, your marketing is going to go nowhere because most of the time, if you go, it's going to disappear because if you ask Amazon uh, Echo to buy, let's say, batteries, they're going to push you Amazon basic batteries, not Duracell, not Energizer. So the brand is disappearing for voice uh, ecosystem. So then you have to take back the lead and still be uh, into that ecosystem and still exist. And just for the information, you can still, uh, if you're looking for immortality, chatbot is a good way to do it. Uh, that's uh, a journalist from the Wired magazine. Unfortunately, his, um, his father was uh, diagnosed with uh, a four-stage cancer. Uh, and then for the last month, he just interviewed him a lot register his voice and so on and so on and then he create a chatbot of his uh, unfortunately dead fa father that he can still talk to and then the thing is could be creepy uh, if you think of it but the thing is maybe for gen z that could be the way to share the value of families to their kids thanks to digital because now uh, this journalist can uh, have access to all the information of the story of his family that was carried on by his father to him. And now with the chatbot, he can carry on to his son and so on and so on. So maybe tomorrow, uh, when you'll be uh, buying a coffin, but we have a lot of years now from that, uh, you, you will uh, add uh, the option of a, a digital chatbot of yourself, so then your kids and grandkids can still uh, talk to you. I don't know if we go there, but. Uh, we'll see. Still, one more scary thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, are on Netflix and uh, watch Black Mirror series. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Black Mirror is already here. So that's from uh, a presentation that uh, I was um, assist assisting uh, in uh, Austin at South by Southwest from Dolby, you know, the sound system and so on. And they were telling us that through the uh, intraocular uh, earphones, they can know everything about yourself. Because they can know all your uh, physio physiological data, how you feel, your heart rate, if you are stressed, uh, and so on and so on. Even if they can uh, know if you are willing to have a mental uh, disease, uh, they can link to your uh, optical nerves, and they know where you look just with an intraocular uh, earphones. So imagine, because some of you have an iPhone or that you have AirPods that are also earphones. That imagine that tomorrow Apple has the same technology within their earphones, they'll know everything about yourself. And while walking in the street, you're gonna look at a, an ad, a billboard and then they're gonna be able to measure uh, the uh, emotion that was created by the billboard, uh, if you look at it, and so on and so on, because that is linked to your smartphone that is uh, all the time located, thanks to technology. So that's some new kind of sensor that's going to come up in the, in the next near future that makes me think about Black Mirror. What about the image? Image is everything. Now you can do everything, like here with Whirlpool, at, that was at CES at Las Vegas, with image recognition, they recognize all the, the products that you have in your kitchen, and they're going to push your recipe depending on what you have. And then, even the mobile application is going to take over the, the oven, uh, 
to pre to heat it and uh, then to cook your food and so on and so on. So now you won't have any uh, excuse to if you miss uh, a recipe anymore. Uh, the thing is also to turn your camera, and that's here with the mobile application Slice in the US, to turn the camera with your smartphone into a buy button, which means I like the Adidas here. I'm going to take a picture of it, and then I'm going to buy it. Easiest way to buy products. Store is closed. I like what's in the, in the shopping window. I take a picture, I buy it, and so on and so on. It's just to ease the access of uh, shopping. We're talking about payments. What about facial payments? It's already in use in China, with, thanks to Alibaba, uh, that is like uh, Amazon, uh, and thanks to Sunning, uh, also, that is a partner of uh, Ben Paper about personal finance in China. You use your face to pay. You don't have to pull off your phone, you don't have to pull out your credit card, just smile, and then you're free to go. That's the easiest way to pay. It reminds me of uh, Minority Report. I don't know if you remember the movie. That was the same thing. And that's already here, and it's already in use. And in China, they even go further, because they use uh, that kind of technology within the street, which means that if, if you have a bad behavior in the street, you're going to get fined, because they're going to recognize your face, and you're going to receive the fine at, in your house. And they have also created a social credit uh, scoring, which means that depending on your social scoring and your behavior on the street, you're going to be able to take planes or not, to take trains or not, or to rent a bicycle or not. Just like in Black Mirror, first episode of the season three. Um, everybody's going to get scored. I give you a score and then I get, a, can I get access to new services and so on and so on. Kind of creepy, <laughs> but still. And your skin also, with, with, I mean, there's big issues about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica now uh, worldwide, but your face is telling everything about your face, about about yourself, even if you have a poker face, uh, because with cameras I can analyze the blood going through under your skin, and then with that I know everything about your emotions, your heart rate, and uh, with a, a simple camera I can analyze you 100 meters away. That is tested by Microsoft, Microsoft in their uh, research lab uh, in the US, for now. So imagine what you could do tomorrow with that in stores for customer tracking. Kind of scary. Um, but still, humans are needed. That's one of my favorite start startups all time. Um, here, that's a Dutch uh, startup. Uh, here, they uh, stream video cameras worldwide from stores. So then you can log in, and if you have some free time, you're going to watch a uh, uh, security camera from a store in, in the US or from a store in China and so on. And when you see uh, someone shoplifting, you just click on the button, and then they're going to send a message to the store manager to arrest the guy. How cool is that? You can uh, uh, arrest people, and then you will receive $5 reward and be paid $5. Uh, just because you have been able to track a shoplifter. Uh, and they still need humans for that and not uh, arti algorithm of artificial intelligence. Um, what about virtual world? That's very, very important. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the movie uh, uh, Ready Player One, but that's what millennials and even Gen Z are thinking of, are wishing for. So you have augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Uh, augmented reality and mixed reality is some reality that you push in the real world, and instead of virtual re reality where your body is going, I mean, your mind is going to a virtual world, somewhere else. But they have some game-changing game uh, launch uh, at the end of last year with AirCore and AirKit, which allows people to develop content uh, on iPhone and Android phone uh, for augmented reality, but an augmented reality that's going to be able to measure the environment and adapt to the environment. It's going to be at scale. So here, for instance, at IKEA, they were the first retailer to use it with IKEA places. So they have a small chatbot here. And then you'll be able to try at the real-size furniture within your living room. So it brings life into digital content. And then you can design your whole uh, apartment just 
through the lenses of your smartphone and buy it in one click and get delivered. You don't even have to measure it because you can measure uh, everything within, within uh, your house. So it's going to ease the way people shop for furniture because that's always uh, I mean, tough to uh, go back and forth to the store because that wasn't fitting and then you didn't have the good size and so on and so on. But now you can measure everything thanks to your smartphone with AirCore and uh, AirKit. And the next step that is being uh, developed by Google is that you won't need any more mobile application. You just go on the website with your mobile phone and then you will get access to uh, augmented reality content through the browser of your web or your mobile phone. Virtual reality is already uh, being tried by some retailers in China. 10 million uh, shoppers are shopping uh, into uh, VR uh, stores. Uh, here in Europe and in the US, Saturn and Walmart is testing virtual stores where people could go and shop online into virtual world. So that's just for test now. Uh, it's not deployed for all the customers. Um, and then you can also have, um, with thanks to smart glasses, you can have a virtual assistant. So here in Saturn, in, in Germany, uh, you have smart glasses from HoloLens uh, Microsoft. And then you're going to walk around and then you will have a, a small uh, uh, sales advisor that could be Credito, for instance, uh, from uh, personal finance. They're going to give you information about all the products you're looking for. So maybe tomorrow, when we all have smart glasses, um, we will have specific uh, assistant, life assistant, that's going to give you information. Like, you know, in Iron Man with uh, Jarvis, could be the same thing. And uh, Intel is working on a smart glasses like this one, where I have a small laser here, and then it's going to push content into the, uh, the glasses. So if I look at you, I'll know your, your LinkedIn profile. Maybe I know uh, where, you work, uh, where, where you work and so on and so on. If I look at product and the price, I know if I can afford it, if I need a loan, uh, and so on and so on. We can even go uh, deeper here um, with virtual reality. That's a startup named Nearable. Uh, and you're, because in the near future, in 15 years from now, we'll all be wearing smart glasses. We won't have any more smartphones. But you, you're not going to talk to your glasses. So the bet of this company is that you're going to control everything with your mind, with brain waves. Uh, that's already the case here. That's, I've seen it at, in Austin uh, last month. And you can even type text just by thinking of the letter. It takes two, meter, two minutes uh, to set it up, depending on your brain, and uh, then you're able to pick up products, uh, to add it to a basket, even to type uh, text and code and so on and so on. That's crazy. So maybe tomorrow everything's going to be through mind control, like in sci-fi. One of the cool stuff, the future of video is going to change in the next 10 years. It's going to be 3D, 360 3D. Not anymore 3D or 360, but both of them. Which means that I'm going to, let's say, film here at the conference. And while I'm watching it live, I may be able, to, as a viewer, to walk around uh, the, the environment, the room, and so on and so on. Even look at my shoes, if I like the shoes, uh, as a viewer. So that's going to change the way people uh, interact with videos because I will have a 3D and 360 view of it. Now it's the beginning. There are a few movies uh, that have come out um, that I won't let you, uh, I'll let you uh, find them. It's mostly for adults. Um, and uh, they're already in. And Facebook has developed uh, its own camera to uh, film in 360 and 3D. But the future of entertainment is this. This, one of the biggest esports events in the world, has toured the planet. I just want to say thanks oh. to all fans who's come here to support us. It means a lot. The video to me. is cool. Love you guys. You have to believe it.
All we want to do is play on the big stage. This is where we grow as players. I think everyone's just really pumped up to get out there. It's a grand stage for a grand game. Against the best in the world! Unbelievable. What a storyline that is. Okay. The biggest, most important point. We have got... I don't know. Maybe I'll... Okay, so I'll have to continue uh, with no slides. Um, so it was about esports. Esports is going to be uh, big, especially for young generation. Uh, in France, for instance, 20% of the population is a big fan of esports. They even watch it on TV. We have live show uh, on uh, ch French channels or uh, to uh, it's mostly FIFA, you know, to play uh, soccer online um, and so on and so on. Ben Pepareba is going to create a competition during uh, Roland Garros uh, for virtual tennis. So you have a specific competition with professional players doing that. The NBA have launched his own uh, NBA 2K league where for six months uh, players will be uh, uh, receiving an income of $30,000 for six months, which is fairly good. And then they have a competition, then they have a one million prize uh, money uh, for it. So that's going to change the way people also uh, mean consume entertainment because it's going to be all into esports. For instance, Katowice is a big success story for the city because they uh, have uh, a worldwide competition and then they bring a lot of tourists to the, to the city. Even Paris now is working on that and they're wishing oh, okay, to have uh, uh, an international competition, an international competition uh, in Paris to bring new kind of tourists in the city because esports is big. Okay, we'll go there. few more clicks and then we go. Yeah, we can pass that. Uh, and you know the ESL, that's uh, eSports League, when you look at the top influencers, it's the 23rd worldwide top influencers in sports, just behind Nike and Adidas. It's crazy. In uh, US universities, they're giving scholarship to video game players to go at the university to create their own team. Because there is an audience, so if there is an audience, there is money. What about automotive? Uh, Pascal mentioned that maybe banks should change their business model. Automotive industry is going to change a lot in the next years because autonomous cars are here, they are for real, and they have new players. Who would imagine 20 years ago that a new player could disrupt the automotive industry. Nobody. Even Elon Musk, who launched Tesla, told uh, all the time that was the dumbest ideas of his life. But still, it's successful. And I've tried uh, two autopilots, the one of Tesla and the one of Mercedes. Let me tell you, Mercedes sucks. They are very, very bad. You still have to keep your hands on the wheel on a tough uh, turn, otherwise you go out, uh, which is not the case with Tesla. Uh, anyway, uh, what would you do with autonomous cars within your car if you don't have to drive? I let you pick one. I don't want to know about the number nine. Um, but still, we'll do st stuff differently within the car. Maybe we'll be walking into the car. So we won't lose time. Maybe we'll be shopping because we are not driving or having sex. Um, it's also a new tool for delivery. Domino's Pizza is using an autonomous car for fraud for pizza delivery in the US. Walmart is working on a truck, autonomous truck, to do its delivery to store to store, from stores to other stores, and so on and so on. All autonomous. Maybe it's going to change also the way retail is made. You know, maybe we'll have a Uber-like uh, retail or stores where I'll be able to know the location of the store with a pod like this one from Toyota. And then I ask for, let's say, the shoe store to come nearby. And then I'm going to try on the shoes, buy the products, and then the store is going to leave. That's already the case in the University of Shanghai. They have a convenience store, autonomous one, that during uh, day class, 
uh, is close to the classrooms, and then at night is close to the dorm rooms, where the population is. So it's easier to consume. So maybe tomorrow we'll have all these polls like this one. Maybe that's going to be my office when I'm traveling and so on and so on. But everything is possible because behind all I've showed you, there is some algorithm, there is some artificial intelligence, even though I don't like the, the word intelligence. Um, because I would say the artificial intelligence of 2018 is like the internet of 1998. Uh, but see, our internet has spread worldwide. It's going to be the same thing for AI. It's everywhere. It's going to be in our life, it's already the case, but it's going to be our, in our life all the time. Uh, that's a lot of investment. Uh, see, one, uh, 141 uh, percent jump of investment in uh, 2017. That's crazy. Everybody is investing in AI. We are investing in AI as a bank as well. A lot. But AI is dominated by two countries. China and the US. 86% of the, all the investment are made into, by these two countries. So they're going to run the world. That's a new uh, nuclear weapon like. Because if I run and manage the uh, artificial intelligence, then I can run everything. So the, the world is going to be torn apart uh, between China and the US. If they are still managing to run artificial intelligence tomorrow. And big, there is nine big companies that control artificial intelligence. Three from China <coughs> and six from the US. But the biggest one is Alibaba. They're going to invest 15 billion dollars in artificial intelligence. So that makes me smile when our French president announced that he's going to create a 1.5 billion uh, investment for the next five years on AI. Because we're going to lose anyway. Um, but still, we'll see how it goes. Uh, now the commerce uh, of today, as I talk about the showroom, is also into the marketplace era. Amazon, for instance, they are everywhere. They are within your house, into the automotive, into the else. They have created company for else to fight cancer. They are in shopping, that's obvious, payments, even leisure, and uh, also uh, logistics. They are buying planes because they want to compete with UPS and uh, uh, the US postal. But who's the boss? If you look at the e-commerce consumers, um, you, the US are very, very small in comparison of the China. We almost have one billion online shoppers in China. So the power is in China now. And if you want to look at new opportunities, don't go to China, go to India. Because that's also starting there. And there's a lot of opportunity uh, for companies over there. And Alibaba, uh, competitor of Amazon but in China, uh, has the same strategy. They are everywhere. So maybe tomorrow I'm going to pay, let's say, 1,000 euros to Alibaba or to uh, uh, Amazon, and they're going to manage my life. They're going to give me food, they're going to give me housing, internet, in energy, an, an automotive, and so on and so on. They're going to give me everything, and I'm going to pay them for that. They're going to run my life. So maybe is that the commerce we want? Uh, if you enjoy the video with great Chinese actor. So that's the project to sell cars in China by Alibaba. Image recognition, scan, they recognize the product, the car. With your scoring real li li live, they know if you can afford it or not, if you're allowed to try it, uh, and so on and so on. Then you book the try with fashion recognition. And everybody's happy. Ooh. And then when they go to the car dealer, that's going to look like that. No human. You go there, they're going to recognize your face, bring the product to you. Then you have uh, three days to try, on, uh, to try the, the car. And whenever you want, 
You just have to click one button to buy it. And they're going to run everything because they, they know all your life. Do you know that single guys in China, they put their credit score into dating application to show women that they're real, reliable and, and secure? Kind of same thing. So that's a lot of technology, a lot of stuff. Uh, but first of all, when you want to try something, uh, there need to be a purpose. Uh, we have seen a lot of companies doing ICO, creating a cryptocurrency, a crypto money uh, for nothing because they need to have a purpose, they need to have an objective. So innovation is great, but think first before trying something uh, because it, has to, it needs to have a purpose for your business and to have an impact for it. And thank you guys. Сега, дами и господа, пак имам, има възможност за задаване на въпроси. Ето сега ще отворя слайдо. А, нека всеки, който желая в залата, а, добри, добри е там с микрофон. А ако някой иска да попита Никола нещо междувременно. Здравейте. Не владея френски, но ще попитам на български. На български, разбира се, имаме превод. А, Никола ни разказа много интересни неща. Аз по едно време помислих, че съм в, на някаква прожекция на, на филм за бъдещето. А, ясно е, че западните страни се развиват много бързо. <laughs> Какво е предвиждането ви за източните държави все пак? В, коя, в такава живеем и ние. Кога това бъдеще ще дойде при нас? So first, I think it's already here uh, some, in some way. Um, we, you, some, uh, somebody asked about the innovation into the store. I think it's more and more transparent because it helps run stores and manage uh, the content, the goods, uh, and uh, to be more efficient because uh, it's killing stores that the product is missing, for instance. So now more and more retailers are using algorithm to predict also the trends, to predict, to predict uh, what's going to be sold this weekend. We have startups here uh, that work with uh, European, uh, Central European uh, retailers that's able to predict what you're going to sell the next weekend, depending on the trend on the internet, the weather, and different uh, data that they gather all together that is analyzed uh, thanks to machine learning, and then they're going to say, okay, you're going to sell, sell, you're going to sell some five bikes uh, this uh, weekend, but you only have two in stock, so we're going to give you three more. So that's already here. It's already in use. Maybe we don't see it, uh, like in minority report, but it's because it's more transparent, and, and, uh, but it's already here. It's already in use everywhere. In the banking, artificial intelligence is used to uh, be able to analyze the huge amount of data that we have. So that's already everywhere. Not like in movie in Seattle, like I showed, but uh, it's already here. And I think it's going to go faster and faster. And all, I would say, the European uh, country is going to catch up in some way from 10 years to 15 years, depending on your level of maturity now. Има ли други въпроси от залата? Добре. Аз бих искал тогава да... Ето този въпрос, поред мен, е много интересен. Един въпрос от слайдо. Има ли сектори от търговията, Никола, които ще останат изцяло онлайн или изцяло офлайн? I think none of them. Uh, they're going to be both, онлайн and offline. Um, and that's the tricky part about our digital world, because you have new tools coming out every day, almost, and you have, as a brand, uh, as a bank, uh, as a retailer, you have to adapt to it because there is always an audience for that new tool. And you need to be there. You need to be on Facebook, but you're not going to talk the same way on Facebook as on Twitter. And you're not going to talk on Twitter as the same way as on Snapchat or Instagram. So you need to adapt at the ecosystem where you are. And that's the tricky part. And that's why it's tough to, for brands to catch up uh, with it. And uh, so I think mostly, it's going to be for all, all the retail, uh, both online and offline in some way. 
Uh, the tricky part is about the population, because I'm pretty sure in the near future, we're going to be divided in two groups, the full digital and the slow tech. And maybe we'll fight each other uh, about what we are looking for. We even have retailers in France uh, that don't want to use uh, digital, uh, trying to, uh, just to prove that, um, I would say, they want to go to the core value of human relationship and then which leads to they have the good products and so on and so on. But still, they need to go to do advertising online, to be visible to the online population so then they can go offline. So it's always a mix of, of the both world. Thank you very much. Here is a question that is very interesting for me, Nicola. The question is the next one. Which sector of the трябва да реагират най-бързо на новите изисквания на потребителите, тъй като това, за което ти ни разказа и това, което в момента е реалността са... Имаме ли превод? Да повторя въпроса ли? Добре, ще прочита, тъй като не ви чувам, ще прочита въпроса още веднъж. А, кои сектори от търговията трябва да реагират най-бързо на новите изисквания на потребителите. Само една секунда. Which sector? I think the first one will be the clothing industry uh, or the fashion industry has to jump on it, uh, otherwise they're going to be dead. Uh, especially when you look at the influence of Instagram on brands and fashion brands. Uh, and then the furnitures. Uh, because if IKEA is able to provide the services that I showed on a mobile application, then you should do the same. Uh, because otherwise, customers are going to go to the more seamless experience. Because we're looking for a uh, seamless experience. We hate to wait uh, for payments. We hate to wait to pick up products and so on and so on. So is the customer journey? Is it? Yeah, that's the key trend. And I think furniture and uh, fashion should jump on it right away. Добре, много благодаря. Нека да изберем друг въпрос. Има ли други въпроси от залата, между другото? Това е един добър въпрос за Европа, тъй като аз мисля, че въпроси за Европа са по-релевантни за Никола. А въпрос, въпросът е следния. В Европа компаниите ли ще подтикнат потребителите към използване на всички тези технологии или по-скоро потребителите ще заставят в кавички компаниите да ги приемат? Кой, ще, кой кого ще накара да а, въведе тези технологии? Most of the time, that's consumers that change the behavior of companies. Uh, because as companies, we lack of change. Uh, we don't like change. Uh, they change the way of method, they change the tools, that needs investment. And uh, I don't know a lot of companies that like to spend money uh, <laughs> through the window, I would say. Um, but so, so that's from the customers. And if you look at it uh, from a European perspective, most of the people online, where do they go to? They go to Facebook, they go to Gmail, Google and Amazon. And that's not European companies from what I know. Uh, so that's the tricky part because 55% of our time is spent over there on these players. So they already own the, I would say, the European consumer. Uh, and that's why the uh, European Commission is trying to regulate also uh, the tracking with uh, GDPR, also trying to regulate the use of artificial intelligence because they know that the only way uh, to uh, control the uh, uh, penetration of such tools is thanks to regulation because that's the only thing we have left. And that's why they try to regulate a lot that kind of uh, ecosystem. Thank you. Here is a question that I think is very interesting. Представяш ли си, аз малко ще го видя, просто за да звучи по-добре, представяш ли си изкуственият интелект да предлага на клиентите на BNP Paribas кредитни продукти преди самите те да са разбрали, че имат нужда от тях? 
I don't know about the privacy on that one, um, <laughs> but uh, I know there is uh, some um, startups that are able to analyze your behavior online and know if you're getting divorced, or if you're, if you're having a baby, because that means that you're gonna have a big change in your life. Because if you're getting divorced, you're gonna look for a new apartment. If you're getting if having a baby, maybe you're looking for a new house also with a bit one more room and so on and so on. That means that you're gonna have need for financial services. You know, so that could be some kind of tools to analyze and uh, uh, decode our behavior online. Um, but maybe in the near future, we we'll say in 20 years from now, we won't even have to ask for a credit. We ev won't even have to ask for the product. It will be delivered without any uh, question asked and constant ask, because they're going to know everything about yourself. Who knows? I'm not wishing for that world. И тъй като пресрочихме малко графика за днес, извинявайте, но много хора трябва да пътуват, мисля този въпрос да е последен, е интересен, тъй като знаем всички, че тенденциите за споделеното потребление са изключително силни и се засилват в последно време и този въпрос е във връзка с тях. А как очаквате тенденцията на споделеното потребление върху пазарното поведение, т.е. как да се отрази тази тенденция върху пазарното поведение на милениумите? Ще купуват ли повече в бъдеще или ще споделят покупките си? They'll share more. Um, the sharing economy for 80% of millennials uh, is a viable economy. Uh, because they have, um, the, how, will, how will you say that? Um, they are aware about what's going on to the world from their environment. Uh, the the also the social goods and our brands. I mean, they they are more willing to go to a brand that has a social purpose. If you buy a pair of shoes and then they offer a pair of shoes to uh, uh, poor people, then they are more willing to buy that kind of brand, uh, stuff like that, because. They are looking for social purpose uh, to feel good about the, themselves as well. So that's kind of stuff they are looking for, and that's why uh, all the sharing economy is getting bigger and bigger to, uh, through younger generation. And that's possible because we have the technology. Uber wasn't possible if we don't have a smartphone and we don't have 3G or 4G. So imagine five years from now we'll have 5G. Also, maybe going to change the way uh, people get access to digital content or maybe create new services that we are not aware of. Много благодаря. Ами, дами и господа, аз предлагам да приключим. Мен бих искал много да благодаря на Никола и на хората, които презентираха преди това, защото вярвам, че първо споделиха много интересни информации, второ помогнаха на всички нас да получим една така, да, възможността да, да видим по друг начин това, което самите ни работим, това, което купуваме, начина по който пазаруваме. Затова бих искал да благодаря на Никола. И благодаря на всички вас за това, че бяхме заедно а, днес тук. Благодаря ви. Заповядайте навън. А, има а, хапване и пиване.